Okay. It'll be good. If you're uh, in, uh, just drop your, um, drop a wave in the, in the chat so I can see who's here. We'll get started in like a couple of minutes. Again, if you are just coming in, just uh, drop a wave in the chat so that I know that you're here. I know that the people are still um, in, uh, I guess they have a bridge session going on right now. Um, so I know folks are just transitioning on. Okay, how you doing, uh, Miss McNeil, Brother Caldwell? All right. Looks like we got eight people watching. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Crossing my fingers to make sure that my son, uh, he's four. He doesn't just, you know, run and Zoom bombers. He's known to do that. <laughs> Good afternoon, um, Christopher Clark. Thanks for tuning in. Two more minutes and then we're going to go ahead and get started. All right, I know that that wasn't quite two minutes, but let's go ahead and get started, y'all, um, because I know that there are other workshops right after us. So um, good afternoon again. Um, my name is Dr. Michael Gary. I currently serve as the Chief Operation Officer for Concentric Educational Solutions. And Concentric uh, is a program that offers uh, um, support solutions for K-12 education to help remove barriers uh, for students um, in urban school districts. So that's what we do. But my background is in higher education. Um, I actually know Dr. Morgan. He was one of my students while at Lincoln. I also went to Lincoln as well. Um, that's where I began my uh, career in higher ed. It lasted about 13 years, but I was just like many of you. I was a student leader when I was in college. And um, my last position as a student leader was Student Government Association president. Uh, my interests, uh, research interests uh, lie around leadership 
and the leadership process as opposed to it being a position. And that's why we are going to have this uh, presentation today, the seven C's of social change. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. And um, if you have any questions, um, just drop them in the chat and um, let's get, let's go ahead and make it happen. Okay, so good afternoon again. Um, today's workshop is the seven C's of social change, using the social change model of leadership to impact social change on your campuses, within your organizations, and then within yourself, most importantly. So just to go through uh, the workshop uh, agenda, if you will, these are the things that we're gonna discuss today. We're gonna introduce the concept of leadership, um, look at it through a theoretical aspect. Then we're going to talk about the origin of the social change model of leadership, the, the, the goals, move into the seven C's, why social change is important for you all as TSU students, um, look at the social change model through the lens of the student leader, and then you know close out with my references so that you all can see where this information came from, okay? So in 1991, Ross looked at uh, leadership uh, through six different ways. He said it's a trait, um, a particular quality that you may have. He said it's a ability. And when we're talking about ability, it's a person's capacity to do something. He said that leadership is a skill set, meaning that you have some type of knowledge base or competency. Leadership, leadership involves relationships and relationship building. So when you have relationships, only good relationships exist when there's a, a good level of communication. He said that relation, um, excuse me, that leadership is something that you do, right? So it's your behavior. And then lastly, most importantly, uh, leadership involves interaction. So it, 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 it engages the influence uh, process. So when we talk about leadership um, as a, phenomenon, we find that leadership manifests itself in different organizations. And to me, he tells this, um, he also said that leadership is one of mankind's most ancient concerns. So if you think about, let's just use an easy text that everybody's familiar with, uh, the Bible, right? So the Bible tells you tons of stories about leadership and relationship building and then influence. Um, even the, the story of Jesus and the story of Christianity, if you will, talks about this experience of influence, um, a, a behavioral influence. And then we're always looking to better understand the leadership process. So this leadership theory comes from two periods in the literature that focuses on leadership theory. First, um, there's contingency leadership, all right? And it, it speaks to how leadership is involved with tasks and relationships. So when you're a leader, you're charged to do something. And since leadership involves relationships, that means that you have to interact with each other. You can't do leadership by yourself. I was just in another session uh, where uh, Lisha said, she, she said that, you know, you can't be out there walking alone. If you look behind you and no one's following you, then you're not doing leadership. And she was exactly right. And then the second period uh, involves the new approaches to leadership theory. When we're talking about how leadership gained um, the trust and respect of followers, and use a leadership style that is based on a feedback from their followers. So a good example of this would be if you are on your computer and you have access to your phone separately, take a second, go to Instagram, okay? And I'm gonna uh, exit out of the presentation so I can see your responses. Take a second and go to Instagram. Do what you do on Instagram normally. Okay, uh, if you could put in the track in, in the chat, uh, just tell me what did you do when you go on when you went on Instagram?
scroll through your feed, Tanya, check your timeline. What else did you do? Looked at pictures. <laughs> Thanks, Justin. <laughs> did anybody like anything? <laughs> oh, okay. There you go. Watch the uh the story. Did y'all like anything? Did y'all get your double tap on? Well, I'm imagining, <laughs> no, you didn't see nothing time that you like. Well, uh, Mike did. All right. So Mike Caldwell, he liked something. And just think about the whole concept of lights um, and that affirmation uh, uh, opportunity that's present in social media. So for Twitter, Instagram, you know, Snapchat or whatever have you, people post things to get lights. I'm not going to post something that I don't like. So I'm going to be posting, whether it's pictures, uh, you know, words, of affirmation, quotes, you know, whatever. You know, I'm selling, uh, the, you know, I'm reselling some Yeezys or something like that, you know, uh, to get a garner a response from people. I mean, just think about it, you know, for my, my sisters that I had to take selfies, you take 40 selfies before you post um, that one. Um, on Instagram because you want to make sure that you have the best representation of yourself or something that's going to be most likable, right? So that is a good way to, you know, conceptualize uh, the new approaches to leadership theory, right? We're looking to our followers to tell us the best way to lead them, okay? Because leadership is about competency that we spoke about but it's also about trust. So think about that, right? Are there any leaders in your circle or in your environment that you, you don't trust? Right? If you don't trust them, you can't have relationship with them. You're not willing to be open to them influencing your life or the di direction in, in which you're going, right? So the trust has to exist first, right? before we even get to the level of competency. You know, I don't care how much you know, but I'm, you know, care how much you care. That whole concept speaks to that. Let's go back into the presentation. So when we talk about this uh, leadership model, uh, we have this married couple. Um, they're both uh, way older than all of us. And they put together a group of, uh, of people, um, if you will, to develop a model for undergraduate students. So while I often do this presentation for student leaders, I've definitely done this presentation for uh, faculty, staff, and administrative psychologists in university as well, because it applies. But this team of educators, they realize like a good jazz ensemble that every contribution um, you know, matters, right, is is essential. So just think about a band, a jazz band or a concert band or, you know, your favorite band or whatever have you. There are various instruments that are present in the band that comes together to make a, collect, make a collective sound. Now, you may have a pianist that is, you know, playing the piano by, uh, by themselves and it sounds wonderful. They're playing chords, a lot of wonderful melodies or what have you. But when you add in the drums and then the bass player, and then a saxophonist and maybe a trumpet player and then uh, a trombone player, you know, that the volume and the, uh, the, 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 the collective sound starts to magnify. And then you, you know, you get this good experience, this synergetic experience um, as it relates to music. So what they realized um, was that college students needed to value working with each other in responsible ways and in ways that didn't necessarily focus on them, but focus their attention outward um, with a goal of social change. Now, the problem with uh, conventional leadership theory is that it focused on leadership positions. So a lot of you hold leadership positions, but that's not important. You need to be focused on the leadership process. And when you're focusing on the leadership process, you take um, the work that you do outside of yourself and you're more concerned with social change or influencing a particular goal, goal of people to do something, right? This is where uh, Pierre de Cruz and, and Kali spoke about leadership being a process 
that drives activities of a group and uses that influence successfully. So whether you're um, the a member of the Student Government Association, you know, and then you all have a collective platform, right? You know, you're coming together, um, you're deciding what's going to drive your activities to help you uh, achieve the goals of your platform. And then you find ways to use your, in your influence successfully, right? You know, a lot of your uh, success is often um, based upon homecoming for you, uh, for example. So, you know, if you have a great homecoming and it looked like you had an effective year, but there are other activities that you can do to use to inf uh, that you can use to influence the student body um, in a way to move uh, collectively to towards social change. Now, this model is values based and it focuses on the individual and their ability to work with others towards shared social concerns. So um, in this model, you want to see we're going to start focusing with the individual and then we're going to move uh, broader out into uh, the larger community. All right. So we have two goals of this model. The first um, in, includes enhancing student learning and development, where we're looking to build human capital and, 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 and motivation. The second is to facilitate positive social change using techniques that will assist the organization to function more humanely and efficiently, right? So being concerned with, you know, your human development or human interaction in the most efficient way. Now, the seven C's of social change describes an exchange, right? So um, there's going to be always, inter always going to be interaction between seven values that individuals, groups, and communities um, should work towards to create social change. So we're going to start with the individual. So there are three C's that fall uh, under this this particular category when we're talking about the individual first you got to know who you are you got to have a sense of self-consciousness right you need to be self-aware um you need to have a good understanding and connection of what motivates you to take action why do you want to be a leader in the first place what social ill or gap or something that was missing in your environment on campus that is driving you to, you know, take on this leadership position uh, where you get the uh, opportunity to act out the leadership process. So in order to, you know, achieve self-awareness and consciousness of self, you need to check in. You need to look in the mirror and see who you are, right? Do a self-evaluation of your personal values, your beliefs and your emotions. And that emotion part is really important. Do you have the emotional intelligence to be a leader? Are you prepared within yourself to deal with the challenges and the setbacks that comes along with the leadership process? What do you believe in? What are your core values? And this conversation that you're having with yourself or maybe with a, 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 a mentor um, or what have you goes right into the second C where we're talking about congruence. So where we see consciousness of self in action and this C focuses on integrity, right? Who are you when people are not looking, right? When you're presenting yourself as an SGA president or a member of a Greek letter organization or the campus king or queen or RA or, you know, you're, you're a class officer. Are, are you the same person in public that you are in private? Are we just meeting your representative? What do people say about you when you're not around? These are the things that you, you, you want to be concerned with. And then uh, when you're doing the self-evaluation, you want to see if you're a congruent person, if those people are the same people. Now, of course, you're going to keep some stuff close to the chest. You, want, you can maintain your privacy, but, you know, do your core values and belief change when you're private, in private alone versus when you're out there in the public? And then again, you know, going back to consciousness of self, we find a connection to the third C, commitment. What are you passionate about? 
What is giving you this energy to interact with folks and try to impact their life? What is driving you to take action? So, you know, going a little bit into my, my personal experience, when I wanted to become SGA president, kind of started out as a joke, like, ah, oh, I could do this. You know, um, my prior uh, SGA leadership members, they, they really seemed to be in it about themselves. They weren't about uh, the people. And then one of my fraternity brothers challenged me and said, hey, yo, you can do this. So I had to start, you know, with the thought of why am I committed to this particular goal? Why do I want to be SGA president? And the thing that I was immediately passionate about was the fact of the matter that there was such a gap between the student body and administrators. And I felt like that they didn't understand each other well. And I wanted to close that gap. I knew that I could be a good con conduit for communication. And that passion and that energy dro drove me throughout my uh, tenure as SGA president. And it also fueled my want to be an educator. I decided when I won that I was going to be in college for the rest of my life, um, not as a student, but more so as an uh, administrator and, and, and a person that was contributing to people who looked like me and had experiences that I had. So that's where my commitment came in. And then you want to continuously self-reflect and make sure that you follow through while you're going through the social change process. Makes sense. So I'm going to check in and see if I got any questions. All right. I don't. Cool. So moving on towards the group. Now, if you know anything about group dynamics, you're not going to do well if you don't take a collaborative pro approach. Leadership is a group process. Like I said earlier, you can't do leadership alone. Right. And when you're thinking about this group process, you're thinking about collective contributions and the strengths and diversity of the relationships of those involved. Right. So, yes, you want people to be on the same page and have collective thought and move forward with one collective idea. But on that process, it's going to be important for you all to use the diversity in ideas and thoughts and people in your group. To, 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 to arrive at the best pathway for it, all right? So diversity in thought is uber important. I like to say that conflict and problems are a positive thing because when you have conflict, there's dissonance in thought and you have an opportunity to see things through the lens of other people. So moving to the next C where, where we're talking about common purpose, we're talking about shared responsibility. Right. When all members share in the vision and can collectively articulate the goal of the task at hand or their group. I like to say uh, to, you know, board members of any student organization. That when you ran for the role of president, treasurer or whatever have you, you may have had your individual thoughts about what it is that you wanted to contribute. But oftentimes we're not running on tickets, if you will, like in, you know, the U.S. government. Right. Everybody's coming to the table with their own ideas and their own thoughts and their own tasks that they want to complete. So what you have to do is find a way to bring those things together so that you can develop and articulate a common purpose so that your work is representative of all those who are involved in your group. You got to think about, you know, your role as the president, that not meaning that you're in charge. You just have a set of tasks and responsibilities that come along with that that position. So that you're articulating your common purpose throughout your work and you're not uh, 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 causing any dissension within in, in your group when you're out there moving along the public. And my favorite C is controversy with civility. When we're talking about open discourse and honest dialogue, right? 
And these are the things that happen behind closed doors. I used to say to my team that, you know, we can fight all we want in here. But when we move out of this meeting, these these executive board meetings, we need to make make sure that we are always advertising or communicating our common purpose. But that pathway or that uh, that the, the role is going to be wrought with a whole lot of discourse, a whole lot of dissonance, a whole lot of honest dialogue so that we can find the best pathway forward. And again, differences will exist in groups. So there's this movie that I don't know if any of you've seen it. Um, it's kind of old uh, with Brad Pitt. It's called World War Z. And it's about well, to make it really quick. It's, a, it's, it's about a zombie apocalypse um, that happened as a result of some bio experiment going wrong. Something like Corona or something. And, um, you know, there was like one country in the Middle East that didn't have any zombies. They uh, did a good job of closing the gates um, to any outsiders. And, you know, essentially they, they, they didn't have a problem. So Brad Pitt, who was the person that was supposed to, you know, find the cure on uh, whatever have you, they, he traveled to the country and he met with the country's leaders. Well, it was 10 leaders. And within that group, they had someone called the designated dissenter. So if nine people all had the same ideas, it was his job to come up with an opposing view and argue that point against the nine. So it was the reason, um, the, the reason that they were, you know, you know, safe and they have any zombies was because the designated dissenter proposed the right idea. He did just not, he did, he was the person that was there not to go with the status quo. So that suggests to me that a part of, as a part of the leadership process, and when we're working towards social change, we need diversity of ideas and thought. We need to respect the, the differences that exist in our groups. Now, when we get to uh, moving towards the community, we have the last C, which is citizenship. Now, when we're talking about citizenship, we're focusing on community engagement that is aimed at providing social change, right? And when we're talking about being a good citizen, we want to make sure that we are caring and we're providing service. And then we're, uh, you know, operating from a place of social responsibility. And then when we we look at the C, we come back to that concept of trust being paramount in leadership. Right. It says that it requires trust amongst the group or community members in solving conflicts while integrating them into the common purpose. Right. So we have trust and conflict again, conflict being a good thing but trust being the foundation of the leadership experience so that people are willing to hear what it is that you have to offer. I remember when I uh, started working at Morehouse, um, which was probably about 10 years ago. Uh, and I came in fresh out of grad school, walked into an environment where, you know, I was trained and prepared, but people were not willing to hear what Mike Gary had to say. They didn't trust me. They didn't know me. I didn't go to Morehouse. I didn't graduate from there. I was a foreigner. I was an outsider. So I had to spend a considerable amount of time building a foundation of trust, working through conflicting experience so that I can have a voice in that space. And it didn't matter that I knew the right answer. I just didn't have the trust of the community to even pose a response to a question or a potential solution to a problem. So if I was to put up the model for you, again, we're talking about this exchange between an individual group and their community. Okay, daddy's doing a presentation right now, buddy. Sorry for the interruption. I knew he was gonna come. Yeah, so go back upstairs with mommy, all right? Okay. <laughs> so, 
Sorry. This is Trip, everybody. He, Whoa. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Go ahead, buddy. Okay. Oh. Sorry about that. We're talking about an uh, exchange between the individual group and the community where we see, again, in the individual bubble, we have consciousness of self, congruence, and commitment. The group we're looking at, collaboration, common purpose, and controversy with civility. And then lastly, we're looking at citizenship. And then we're all centered around this outcome of change. Okay? And as you can see that there are arrows on both ends of the lines because it's just not a process that just goes linear straight forward. It's an exchange, it's back and forth. So the individual has influence on the community. The group has influence on the individual and vice versa. So the question at hand is why social change? This is uh, a question I like to ask of people. Why, uh, I'm not why, uh, how many of you can tell me what the mission statement of Tennessee State University is? And I'll give you an opportunity if anybody knows it, just say yes, and then I'll ask you to post it. All right, come on, Mike, what's the mission statement? I'm gonna give you a second to, uh, Nope. That's the model. But even considering the model, you know, think, work, serve, right? You know, what, what the model speaks to um, um, social change. Google got you, though. See, look, I knew you got it. <laughs> I knew somebody was going to Google it. But the same, at the same time, I want to go ahead and... and, and, and I'm sorry, y'all. So, again, um, just doubling back real quick. When we talk about uh, the mission statement, the mission statement is basically the contract between you and the university. This is what the, the, the university says that it does for its students. And... Um, when we're talking about why this model um, works well for colleges and universities, 
the mission statements pretty much speak to their goal of social change. And, and this is how it works. When we sp speak into the individual, right, we're looking at how Tennessee State prepares you for leadership, professional success, and personal achievement. This is what it says that it does for you. And then moving towards the group, we're talking about this relationship, this service to local, national, and international communities, right? So what does Tennessee State University do for the local Nashville area? How does uh, uh, graduates of Tennessee State um, you know, impact uh, lives on a national level? And then when we're talking about community, its impact on global society. So, you know, are you all conducting research? Um, are you doing community service? Are you all out there helping with Habitat for Humanity? Are you going to Haiti after a hurricane? Or, you know, thinking about that global work that you all are doing that provides you all an opportunity to impact social change on that level, right? So when we think about the social change model and the student leader, we're looking at the individual and that's you, of course. Moving to the group, your student organization, how your org is contributing to social change. And then thinking about the community abroad, we're talking about the Tennessee State University community or the work that your organization does um, to impact the larger community, the global community or what have you in the world. And with that, these are uh, you know, my references. I'd like to thank you all for participating and then at this time I'll you know, take any questions that you, you may have. If you have any questions, you can uh, place them in the chat. So uh, Mike asks, how long have I been uh, teaching? Um, I have only taught classes um, a short period of time. Um, I've taught in doctoral programs and I've taught um, undergraduate courses as well. Uh, but most of my career has been in, uh, on the administrative side looking how uh, looking towards how to complement the work that happens in the classroom so that you all can be successful good question mike any other questions you're welcome So as a reminder, you know, um, when we're thinking about leadership, you want to, again, first understand that leadership is a process. It's not just a position, right? You're not, once you get into the position, the work is not done. It's just beginning. Um, if you plan on influencing others, others, you need to make sure that you start with a foundation of trust. People got to know and believe that you're actually there for them and you're not just there for the position, right? So that's why it's important for you all to start with understanding that leadership is a, po a process. So once you get past the process, you build a foundation of trust, you need, and then you get the opportunity to show people how competent you are, but you have to be prepared for that. So make sure that you work on your leadership skills, work on developing your competencies and your skill sets when you're entering in these roles. And with that um, in mind, if there aren't any other 